what is the metaverse? Well, let's start right here. Uh, it's not this, right? It's not the idea of essentially uh, wearing a television on top of your nose. A lot of people have said that's kind of what it is because of the bulky headset and stuff that, we, that you'd have to wear to actually try it. But Ray Kurzweil, a, a colleague, futurist colleague of mine, um, who's been talking quite a bit, of, of course, about the singularity and, and related things. And he says basically by 2030, virtuality will be totally holistic and compelling. Uh, he may be a little bit uh, late with his uh, prognosis because I think it's going to happen quicker than that. We're going to spend more time in virtual environments, helped by the pandemic in parentheses, of course. Um, and he also says by 2040, uh, we're going to see a lot of majority of people uh, and their communications taking place in what he calls non-biological substrates, which basically is the metaverse. Right? And again, this was in 2003, so kudos to Ray for saying this. But here is a message that I have a bit of a hard time with. Uh, we will all become virtual humans. Um, well, I think we could become virtual humans. The question is, do we want to become virtual humans? And what is the benefit? Are we gaining something here? And this is what I want to talk about. My bottom line here is really that the metaverse, I think, could be great for business. But what will it do for us humans? Uh, human relationships, societies, uh, our future, our feelings, our network, the way that we communicate. That is, to me, the very big question. Let's start a little bit more into uh, the background of the metaverse. Of course, uh, in the 80s, it was John Baudrillard who talked about what he calls the hyperreal, right? Is this idea of a hyperreality uh, context that we can go into. I think he was the first one to kind of start with that word. And then, of course, it was uh, spelled out in Snow Crash. Uh, Neil Stevenson's brilliant novel uh, on essentially the metaverse, and I think uh, that is 1992. Then, of course, we have The Sims, that was around 2003. Great picture here from the Wall Street Journal. Thanks very much. And then, of course, we have Second Life, which I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to witness in its first edition, and it's still there, of course. Uh, I read an interview with a guy the other day saying that Second Life is very much alive. So, um, well, let's see what happens with Second Life. In this, I think that Rosedale, the original guy, is now part of the Facebook team. And then, of course, we have Ready Player One, the novel, and I think it's also a film, talking about climate change and what's happening here. And, of course, Minecraft, the ultimate uh, really metaverse that already exists where millions, hundreds of millions are playing this game. I've only tried it a few times, didn't really have the patience, but maybe I should. And of course Roblox, yeah, that is really the uh, functional metaverse that we see everywhere. A gaming environment where you can have parties on the yard. I think this is actually um, Britney Spears here uh, showing off her fancy yard. And of course now you have uh, big companies like Gucci and others going into the metaverse to actually create sales environments and so on. That's happening everywhere, kind of like the internet was a, a while ago with exclusive things. And of course, ultimately Facebook and the horizon world that Facebook is building. I'll talk more about that, of course, in a second. What I really like is the concept of the Facebook workroom, of course, right? That would be a great boon over Zoom and other applications that we currently are using. Um, I wonder if I would get addicted to it, like I'm addicted to Zoom in a way, or my mobile phone. Probably not such a great idea. Um, and, you know, talking to people in that metaverse like CBS that you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, yeah, Mark will tell us, I am sure. I will have a comment on Mark very, very soon in this show today. And of course, now we have people getting married in the metaverse in India. And I, I think this is not the only ones who are doing that. And we have people buying stuff in the metaverse. Would you buy a home in the metaverse? The Financial Times is asking. My answer is definitely not. Um, but you may be of a different opinion. I'd love to hear your chat, uh, see your chat later and, and reply to that. So please go ahead and put in that comment. Okay, of course, you know, we have now a buying spree of people buying virtual property. I don't quite understand this, but maybe you can enlighten me later. And now, of course, the metaverse clearly is something that is going to uh, blow away a lot of expectations. And some people are saying it's all bullshit, basically not real. And the jury's out on this. The event of the PlayStation thinks it's just pointless, useless, right? And then we have, of course, marketing people who are always going to love new things that they can sell to, like this marketing agency believes, the future of work is in the metaverse. And of course, here are the best ones, really. 
from The Onion, you got to check this out, The Onion slideshow in the metaverse, uh, Reed Hastings from Netflix, whatever it is, I'm using that as a reason to raise prices. I mean, I'm sure you're going to have a good chuckle on this one. It is just so true, isn't it? And the second one, Jeff Bezos, soon it'll be indistinguishable from the actual world in that I will also own most of it. I think that kind of sums up a lot of people's ideas about the metaverse. And so I've been thinking about getting a Gerdiverse. I know it's, it doesn't sound as sexy as a metaverse, but maybe, you know, maybe the Gerdiverse is a good idea. Let me know what you think of that. Just kidding. And so bottom line really is now I made a fancy graphic for you. Thanks to my web guy and my, my editor, my brilliant video guy, Sylvain, and my team around Marcia and Stephanie and others to help me build those things on the fly today. We finished this, in fact, this is what the metaverse really is, right? Most importantly, virtual reality, of course, and AI-powered virtual reality and mixed reality and, and the avatars that will make you look good. So it's not gonna be fancy green screen or bad green screen, rather. Built in crypto commerce and NFTs, non-fungible tokens to buy stuff with real-time environments and spatial audio. I think the spatial audio is the important part, right? Because imagine you, if you're in a conversation and somebody's talking over there, you don't talk, you don't look over here, you look over there. And spatial audio is going to be really, really important. Of course, the really important angle, angle here is the CEO of Intel said the other day, we don't really have the computing power to make all this work right now, especially not for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, Intel says that's 10 years away. Uh, to have enough computing power to actually build these things and run them. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, and as, well, you know, computers already are 20% of the CO2 that we're putting out there. Now it will maybe go up to 200%. So a couple bottom lines on this one as well. So first, I think 3D and AI, that is really what it's all about. So no longer sort of lame 2D environments. That is, again, super heavy, intense processing. Uh, the Internet of Things connected devices, the Internet of Everything, the IOE, feeding into real-time environments, and what's been called the creator economy, which I very much doubt that it will change much for the creators, but hey, you know, I'm willing to experiment and give it a try. I've heard it before, didn't work, and of course, finally, this is one of the issues, right? The interoperability. Are we really going to have platforms that are interoperable where I can uh, take my all my stuff all the fancy Ferraris I bought on the Metaverse, can I take that over from one platform to the other? I very much doubt it. Um, that's been touted as the number one thing, and I, I don't think that will happen anytime soon. But again, you maybe have different opinions on this. Bottom line of that stuff is, if we're looking at what's currently being shown, for example, for Metaverse, is that it's pretty impressive and it kind of, you know, it seems very kind of normal and interesting, right? When you're miles apart, you can work together using the Facebook horizon, the workroom that Facebook has put in together. That seems like a good idea. I, I certainly would love that. But then you have to wonder about what else is happening there in terms of data mining and security, a place to sketch and all that stuff. And here, the best one, I really love this one. <laughs> it's about meditating in the metaverse. Um, that seems to be a plausible application that yeah, you can, med you can meditate by yourself or you can do it here. Seems kind of an interesting take on what could happen in the metaverse. And of course, digital twins for production and so on, uh, being able to essentially see spare parts and stuff in the metaverse. Siemens does that a lot and a lot of really interesting things are happening here. Totally clear application, not a lot of really bad side effects. And ultimately, of course, shopping, this is Walmart. Uh, Walmart is everywhere when it's about the, uh, the stuff, right? It's, it's amazing how Walmart is getting engaged in all of that stuff. Pretty, very powerful things. Um, so I don't know whether I would like shopping in the metaverse more than shopping uh, that I do online on the mobile now, but there uh, seem to be great hopes for this. But then again, it's all about commerce, right? This is all really what's happening here. The idea of selling more stuff. NVIDIA has, of course, a driving application here. I got to show you this again with a tiny little uh, uh, digital icon there that hops up and down and that will speak to you. Thankfully, you can't hear it right now because it's not making a lot of sense, but uh, interesting how that, how that happens. And here's, of course, the most powerful slide here. As we already found out in the entire COVID year last year and the year before that, the tech giants are booming and they're booming because we need more tech than ever before. And there has been more digital transformation in the past 18 months and the previous 18 years probably. And the numbers are astounding when you look around this, right? And the metaverses yield as an other major boom like uh, these guys are saying, oh, basically, you know, every large corporation is gonna to have to go in the metaverse. I heard this before. 
Of course, in the first period of the internet, and that became kind of true, but then again, it's all relative now to what we're seeing out there. Here's the key question for me as I'm looking at this sort of metaverse future. Uh, we all be running around like this in our $5,000 headsets, right? It could be heaven for business, right? Uh, it could be heaven for the tech industry and for commerce, but maybe it's hell for people. And that is a real problem because we already have a hell for people, right? That's called social media. <laughs> it is the drive to always perform something or the other. It is the drive to always connect and to always share. I mean, this is creating a lot of problems for democracy and so on. I'll talk more about that in a second, but this may be the very issue. It could be fantastic for money, right? And of course, it would also increase the digital divide because well, you're going to need some pretty serious equipment to participate in the ominous metaverse, right? So that is definitely going to be another issue here. But let's look at some details behind this and figure out where this is going. I think this is part of my argument where I think the metaverse could be really interesting, but I don't want it to become the meta perverse. Perverse in the sense of, yeah, I could if I had $5,000, right? Or I could if I had a T1 internet connection, right? Or I could participate if I had XYZ that allowed me to do this, right? And if I'm going to be completely losing my privacy. I read an article this morning saying that basically the metaverse could mean the end of privacy altogether, right? I mean, it's, yeah, that really is a very, very big question in my mind. Are we getting something good here? Or are we swapping something that is kind of dubious? And again, Mark Zuckerberg comes to mind, of course. And he wants to track your eye movements and, and facial expressions. Well, that's not new, but it's definitely another dimension. Right? And Zuckerberg, of course, also building the world's largest AI supercomputer. How come this is not making me feel very comfortable? <laughs> right? I mean, is that going to end well for us? I mean, compared to what has happened so far with Facebook, the answer is definitively no. And so here's the question I have for you. Social media issues that we know, the problems and aberrations and all the stuff that has happened and of course all of the consequences of social media gone wrong. It may be like this, but X500. And that's not something we would want. Uh, we don't want the metaverse to be like social media, super exponentially uh, power fight, you know, to, to actually take over everything. We want it to be a tool that we can use. Right? And so here's our friend Mark Zuckerberg and, and explaining what he means with that. Our company is now meta. Our mission remains the same. It's still about bringing people together. Yeah, now they're called Meta, but you know, they will continue doing what they do best and doing all the social things and all these things. But here's my concern, right? What if in the end, right, what if we get more of this? We get more data mining. And that's kind of, uh, you know, that's obvious that's what's going to happen, right? Because you can data mine your facial expressions and your eye movement. And I mean, this would be the most perfect tracking mechanism ever devised. And, um, and of course, then we would live inside of it. We couldn't get out. I mean, the world would be so boring without those goggles on, especially when they're no longer, you know, big clunky things, but right here or on my iris, which of course you've seen all of that in science fiction movies. Right? But that is my, my, my biggest concern. Will companies like Facebook and, and Microsoft also, of course, work on this and NVIDIA and many others, in this quest of creating a new business moment, of creating a new internet, essentially, to uh, quadruple their valuations once again, that will they forget about this, right? Will they forget about what technology actually is? You know, technology, of course, is the real challenge, is more than neutral until we use it. It doesn't have any ethics. It doesn't know when to stop, right? It doesn't know when to take things away. It doesn't know how to protect our privacy and why it matters, right? It knows everything except for that which makes life worthwhile. It's just logic, binary logic, right? So here's a really important part. Because it has no ethics, we're going to need some sort of protection mechanism here. And I like to use this shield, you know, the saying that we know we need to protect what makes us human. The more we connect, the more we must protect. And can we do that on the metaverse? Quite unlikely. We're going to get more naked. Um, in many ways, you could say, well, it doesn't matter because we get all the benefits. I think it does matter. You know, if you don't care privacy, then you know, there's nothing that you don't want people to know about you, um, then you must be a robot. You know, that's how I look at it. Yeah. So basically technology and humanity, we need to think about, of course, as I, as I talked about a lot in my previous book, which I show you here right now with my new fancy gadget, um, 
five years ago, technology versus humanity. I talked about this a lot, uh, why it's important to protect humanity and to be more human. Because here's the challenge. Uh, technology is a gift in so many ways. I really do think it's a gift. I feel very delighted to have WhatsApp and, well, not WhatsApp so much, but say Signal and Telegram and Spotify and others. Despite of Neil Young, I feel happy with Spotify. But what if it turns into a bomb? You know, what, what if technology becomes a sort of a factor of dehumanization? And I think this is really what's happening in the metaverse, that uh, seeking to de dehumanize society, that could be a great business because dehumanization would be so nicely paid using technology instead of using other people. That is just not human. And I think for us, you know, to work there is one thing, and to transact there may be another thing, to buy there, but to live there, right? Here's a, f a famous tech CEO, which I will not quote because I don't want to mix up the uh, issues here, but this person says it's moving to what people are calling ambient computing, which we've heard before, right? It's about being within the computer rather than accessing the computer. It's about always being online rather than having to access uh, an online world. And really what it is in the end, it's come down to this, right? It's about being the computer, becoming one with the machine. I think that is just a really bad idea. It's, a, it's one thing about becoming one with your shopping cart uh, and using that for practical purposes or with Wikipedia, right? But imagine if you were stuck in this online world and you couldn't boot up in the morning if you didn't have it. Well, you're going to end up straight in the Matrix right? or, the, or Blade Runner right? to be the computer. Here's a great uh, thing I, I found yesterday. Uh, it's from uh, Hitachi, I think, actually. Um, it's talking about proxy experiences, right? Uh, it's, it's an interesting concept. I think proxy experiences are great when it's about things like uh, computing or maintenance, right? Um, Hyundai, that's what it was actually. But proxy experiences are useful for many things like industrial environments, but except for what makes us human, right? The concept of living in a proxy experience. Well, why would we do that? We want real experiences, right? What makes you tick, what makes me tick? Experiences, engagement, relationships. Completely non-tech. Will we find that in the metaverse? I kind of have my doubts. We'll find many other good things there, right? And here's the question when you think about that. Would you prefer to live in such a world? Would you prefer a convenient simulation? The messy reality of people? Can we do away with that? I think Dr. Rushkoff said a few times that in Silicon Valley many things are looked at it like this, like the human is the problem. We do away with the human and of course our body, which is a huge problem because we don't really need it. Right? Just put our head in a petri dish and upload our brain to the internet as Elon Musk wants us to believe. It's a complicated messy reality, but I think this is what makes us human. Right? The inefficiency, right? the unplanned, the tacit knowledge. Right? And we are already living in a world where this is kind of like many people have more relationships with their screens than they have with people. And in many ways you can already say that we're praying at the altar of technology. Technology is a religion and it's also a drug. Well, of course, you know, the combination of the two is the, uh, the utmost uh, jackpot, right? But it's, it's getting us addicted and then we're going to move to the next level where it's about virtual reality and I kind of feel like you know, we, we can try this and we can get involved there, but in the end, are we going to fall off the cliff and just get lost in all the possibilities? And, and who will make sure that we don't? I mean, the business will be just too big uh, to not do that. Eh? Too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. You heard me say this quite a few times before, and I think this is really, really true for the metaverse. Uh, a good thing for digital twins, for production, for shopping maybe, but a very bad thing for personal relationships. And we shouldn't overdo this. You know? There has to be a balance between those two because many people are saying well, no, we're, we're being sucked into a new universe, a new internet, and, and the whole hype about the metaverse is the future of the internet. Right? Well, that's an interesting way of putting it. Does that mean this? Right? Does it mean all of the things that have gone wrong? More user monetization, more surveillance, more inequality, more feudalism, more surveillance, more simulation? Do we need all of that? Of course, the internet has many good things that aren't here on this equation, but we don't need that to be amplified. We need to be better. And is the metaverse going to do that? I kind of have my doubts. You know, it's primarily right now, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gold boom. You know, it's a gold rush towards new digital gold and, and basically following the principle of pretty much everything that we have invented is profit and growth. 
And I think it's really time for us to switch to a new way of looking at the world. Uh, people, planet, purpose and prosperity, as I like to say, not just profit and growth. And is that going to be in the metaverse? Are we going to be concerned with people and with the planet and each other and the community? Is that going to be part of the metaverse? Or is it going to act like it's just a giant gold rush? Like, I love this picture here of the Wall Street uh, uh, bull with the glasses on. You know, it's going to be worth trillions, or, uh, hundreds of trillions. But clearly, I mean, yes, that's kind of like the oil industry 50 years ago, worth hundreds of trillions. Is it a good thing to do? Are we going to keep on making money, good money, with doing bad things? Right. We're going to trust this guy? I very much have my doubt that this would be the right way to move into the future, when basically what's happening here is a, is a giant money machine for social networks. And I think it's already enough of a money machine. I think Facebook makes something like $320 million revenue a day and like $120 million profit per day. Where is that money going? Well, definitely not towards taxes. You know, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, Zook probably owns the entire uh, Pacific Heights region now. And the other thing is uh, the whole discussion about that being interoperable and then you can switch one profile to the other. That's not going to happen. Right? These companies are competitors. Apple, Microsoft, uh, 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 NVIDIA, and Roblox, and, and everybody who's getting in on this story. It's not going to be decentralized. It's not going to give us the pipe dream of a just and democratic and user-to-user -user encrypted private and perfect internet. That's not going to happen here. I think we're going to go back to this. Right? That's, that's what I fear. And I think that is not what we want. I think we can use that for business. That would still work just fine, just like we do now for messaging services and so on. But the metaverse, as, as, I, as I see it now, it's more of this, right? It's more addiction, it's more overheating. Right? It's, uh, it's like social media times 500. And so that part of it doesn't really get me excited because I think it also does this thing about disembodiment. There's like a medium uh, in between. And it kind of feels like we don't have to be human anymore. All we need is internet access and, and a head. Not even a head because it's, you know, I can use an avatar. Right? <laughs> and also this kind of reductionism where we think that everything can be expressed as code. It cannot. And we're going to need to meet each other and go face to face and see each other. I mean, basically the human eye and everything around us, we recognize things in four seconds that the computer takes four years to do. Um, and, and this is what makes us human, is that imperfection is being the opposite of technology. Right? This kind of reductionism, that leads to this idea of like a happiness kit, which has been, you know, there's a happy fork and many other things already using that same concept. Yeah, well, of course it can make us happy to connect to others. I mean, to send free messages and all of that, yes. But it's a kind of more simple happiness. Yeah? I mean, you could basically say it's, it's a kind of hedonism, which is not a bad thing. But I don't think we, we will find happiness, real happiness, on a screen or in a cloud or on the metaverse. It doesn't mean metaverse isn't any good. It is. We can find many things there. Convenience, transaction, uh, competence. Right? As Stuart Russell keeps saying also about AI, it's not about consciousness, it's about competence. And we may find that there. We should just not expect to be happy just because we're connected in such a way. I mean, movies have shown us how all that, all that works. The first Blade Runner, of course, the whole discussion about, you know, human copies and more human than human. Remember that scene from the Tower and the Tyrell Corporation? And then the second one, which was 2046, of course, even better, the whole discussion about the metaverse uh, is already a part of this because holograms are already doing very much a similar thing, right? It's, is enticing people into believing that this is real, uh, replacing our presence with a simulation. Algorithms know the logic of everything, but the feeling of nothing. And of course, this is the, this is the problem, and this is what we are. We are completely on, completely on the other side. So the metaverse has to remain a tool. It could not become the purpose. And I think the current discussions are dangerously close to becoming a purpose. We even already have a name for this thing, right? That people are no longer connecting with real people, uh, called the nature deficit disorder. You know, making people unhappy to be real. We have to be real and connect with nature, with, with each other, which is not going to be in a virtual environment. It is on the beach or in the, in the forest, in the mountains, or in a conference, not on a virtual call. That's what makes us happy, right? Those are experiences. So nature deficit disorder, you should peg that for the future. 
You know this film, of course, Her, a great film about the future and what's happening there in the, his metaverse already. And it's really quite clear that what's missing there in his picture is all the stuff that makes it real. Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment, and all that stuff, of course, is called PERMA. Martin Seligman, you should read his book about this definition of happiness. But that's not what's there, right? That's somewhere else completely. And so I feel we're going into this future where we are gradually becoming uh, connected and hyper-connected and, you know, the, the remote controlled by this reality. Right? What kind of future is possible? That's not a very good question. Of course that future is possible. The metaverse will be possible. We will have the computing power. It will take a little bit longer. But what kind of future do we want? I think we will very well have a metaverse for financial transactions or for shopping or for, for industrial production and so on. But do we really want to live inside of that? Do we want to be in the computer at all times? I think that is a very, very, very bad idea as we're moving into that future where everything is a game or can be gamified. Right? And nothing is real and if it was real it wouldn't matter and anything can be created. I can become anybody. Well, that is not the kind of future that I think our kids will feel happy in. And this is a question that I have, of course, a lot of my work on the good future. I made a film about the good future, uh, and this is also speaking about this topic. And so I think we really have to keep this argument in mind in how do we get to a good future? What kind of future do we want? Right? Because we're going to be surrounded by technology. I call this here the, uh, the Neoluvian man, woman, of course, not the Vitruvian man, which is Leonardo da Vinci, surrounded by technology. That is going to be great because it, or it is great because it gives us all the tools and powers. That is a good thing. But if we, we don't want to suffocate our humanity because we're connected. It's about balance. Right? It's about being able to exist without it. It's, it's about uh, having our own human agency. And I, I think this is where it becomes important to think about the good future. Technology must remain a tool and not become a purpose. And this is the biggest grief I have about uh, the metaverse. Right? Confusion, I think, on what is real and what's not, that's going to lead to a lot of sickness. Uh, digital obesity, I talked about this, you know, I don't know, 500 years ago, not 10 years ago. Right? I mean, you know, that, that kills us to have too much information. I mean, literally, you know, kids on Instagram, of course, you know that story, but a lot of unhappy kids comparing themselves to others. So it could be heaven or it could be hell. Also, what you would expect me to say from our past speeches. But here's a new angle. I think if we want a future, we're going to need a shield on protecting us from that hell. And where is that? Are you seeing that anywhere? I see a lot of people crying, new business, new development, new profit, new growth, new land grabs, literally. Right? But what about us? Right? Is there something here that transcends profit? So, if you're going to go in the metaverse as a company or as a, as a person, spend as much time and dollars and money on your humanity than you spend on technology. And then you'll see, I think, in the end, how we can reach happiness in some way or the other that is fueled by technology but not run by technology. So check out my film, The Good Future, thegoodfuturefilm.com, and what that has to do with the, with the uh, uh, metaverse. I will elaborate a little bit further some other time. Mm -hmm.